Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Allworth Center for Peace and Justice lecture series at the College of St. Scholastica in Duluth, Minnesota. From wherever you may be listening, thank you for joining us. My name is Tim Borek. I'm an assistant professor of history here at the College of St. Scholastica, and I'm excited to be assuming this new role as director of the series. Our longtime director, Dr. Tom Morgan, now retired, has passed the baton to me, and I'm grateful for all the work he has done for this series over the years, including his assistance with this transition. Tom is joining us tonight from his home in Duluth, so hello, Tom, and thank you again for your leadership and vision with this series. Our program tonight features Anu Bradford, who will speak to us from New York on the topic, How the European Union Rules the World. We regret that we've had to move this series back into this virtual format due to the logistical complications and public health concerns of the ongoing pandemic, but we are grateful to Anu for her flexibility and our tech team for their guidance. Before introducing Anu and beginning the lecture, I'd like to run through a few short housekeeping details. First, as always, we'd like to pause and thank our generous donors. First and foremost, the Allworth family. This series is also possible thanks to funding from the DeWitt and Carolyn Van Evra Foundation and the Mary C. Van Evra Foundation Endowed Fund in memory of William Van Evra. Additional support comes from the Global Awareness Fund of the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation, the Edwin H. Eddy Foundation, Reader Weekly, Duluth Sister Cities International, the League of Women Voters of Duluth, the Royal D. Allworth Jr. Institute for International Studies at the University of Minnesota Duluth, and other private donors. Speaking of the Allworth Institute at UMD, this year's series is a joint collaboration between our two programs on the theme, The World Beyond Our Borders. The next lecture in this series is scheduled to take place at the University of Minnesota Duluth on February 24th at 7 p.m. and will feature Dr. Monda Muyangwa, Director of the Africa Program at the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. This is scheduled to be a hybrid event, and I've been told that there could be a change to the program, so please check the UMD website for updates at allworth.org. The next event hosted by the College of St. Scholastica will be Thursday, March 24th at 7.30 p.m. on Zoom, and will feature award-winning journalist Kim Gattas, who will speak to us about the rivalry between Saudi Arabia and Iran. That will be a virtual event and details and registration can be found at css.edu slash spotlight. After the lecture tonight, we will hold a question and answer session with our speaker. Feel free to submit questions as we go via the Q&A button on the bottom of your, of your Zoom screen. After the lecture, I will moderate the questions and filter them to our speaker. Now on with the lecture. Anu Bradford is the Henry L. Moses Professor of Law and International Organization at the Columbia Law School, as well as the Director of the European Legal Studies Center at Columbia University. Bradford has practiced EU law in Brussels and has been an economic advisor in Finland and in the European Parliament. She's the author of The Brussels Effect, How the European Union Rules the World, published by Oxford University Press in 2020. Her talk today will synthesize some of the key takeaways from the book and we'll run approximately 40 to 45 minutes after, we, after which we should have plenty of time for questions and discussion. Anu, thank you again for joining us and now over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Tim. Uh, I am delighted to be here and uh, good uh, evening, everyone. Coming from Finland, I was very excited about an in-person visit to Minnesota. And uh, unfortunately, we could not proceed with that, but I am really delighted to have this engagement uh, over the Zoom tonight. So let me start with the, uh, maybe an explanation of why I wrote the book with the name, The Brussels Effect, Why the European Union Rules the World. So this book is my contribution to the ongoing conversation that often portrays the European Union as a declining power, as the kind of power from the past that today has very little ability to influence the course of the world, whose best days are over because that is not the kind of European Union that I see daily in my research and in my teaching. So let me give you a few concrete examples of what I mean by European power and, and prevalence today. So let's start from the West Coast of the United States and some of the biggest technology companies, 
So if you think about, for instance, Facebook or Meta as it's called now, Microsoft or Apple or Google, these companies have one data privacy policy across the world. And that is the European GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. So these companies have decided to adopt the European privacy norms, but also then apply those norms when they do business in the United States or across the other parts of the world. And if we stay with the industry and think about again, Facebook or YouTube or Twitter, these companies are not looking at the First Amendment of the United States Constitution when they are deciding what kind of speech they take down as hate speech. Instead, they are using the European Union definition of what constitutes hate speech. So these are some examples of how the European Union law is penetrating across the global marketplace. And this is not just the story of American companies or technology industry. The EU law also determines how timber is harvested in Indonesia, how honey is produced in Brazil, what kind of pesticides African farmers use in their cocoa farms? What kind of chemicals Japanese toy manufacturers put into their toys? Or what kind of facilities are installed in Chinese dairy factories? So these are examples of a phenomenon that I call the Brussels effect. And by the Brussels effect, I defer to the European Union's unilateral ability to regulate the global marketplace. So the EU is one of the largest and wealthiest consumer markets in the world. And there are very few companies that can afford not to trade in the EU if they are global companies. So as the price for accessing the lucrative European market, these companies need to comply with European regulations. That is not surprising. Where it gets interesting, is that often these companies conclude that it is in their interest to apply the European regulation across their global conduct and global production because they want to avoid the cost of complying with multiple different regulatory regimes. So all the EU needs to do is to regulate the single European market. It is then the global companies and their business interests that are transposing the European regulations across the global marketplace. So those are uh, the examples of the Brussels effect and that is basically the, the intuition behind the Brussels effect. But let me now uh, talk a little bit about why we see the Brussels effect and why are we not talking about the Washington effect or why are we not observing the Beijing effect? Why the EU? So obviously a starting point for any jurisdiction that wants to unilaterally exercise global regulatory power, you need to be a big market. If you are, let's say Costa Rica, and you decide that you really want to regulate the environment with stringent rules, what do the multinational companies do if they find your rules to be too costly? They just abandon the Costa Rican market but it is very hard to abandon a large market the size of the European Union. But that doesn't yet explain to us why we don't see the Washington effect or we don't see the Beijing effect. The US is also a large market. China is also a large market. So what I argue in the book that you don't only need a large market, you also need to have the regulatory capacity the legal institutions that allow you to unleash that power of the large market and convert it into tangible regulatory influence. And this is why China is not a global regulatory superpower. They are building regulatory capacity, but they are still a long way from having the bureaucratic apparatus that is generating rules in Brussels that has the expertise and the ability to enforce those rules even outside the EU borders. What about the Washington effect? There is plenty of regulatory capacity and expertise in Washington DC. What is missing in the United States is the political will to deploy 
that capacity. That capacity largely sits idle in Washington. And this is not just because when we have a Republican president, whether you have a Democratic or Republican president, we have not regulated that much in the US. So since about 1990s, um, early 1990s, the US took the decision that was really deliberately to walking away from regulation, to really hand it over to the markets and pursue a deregulatory agenda. So inadvertently, by stepping away from the role of the regulator, the Americans ceded the market for the European regulators to step in and become the jurisdiction that is generating those stringent rules. So the EU today is the origin of most of the stringent regulations. Because the logic here is that the, the jurisdiction that gets to set the global rules needs to be the large market, has the regulatory capacity, but also the political will to generate high standards. Because for the global company, to, if they choose one standard, because they often prefer uni, uh, uniformity to multiple different standards, if you choose a high standard, it means that when you comply with that high standard, you're good to go for the other markets as well. If you choose the lower American standard, then often you are not able to sell your products to the European Union market. But if you comply, for instance, with the European Union environmental regulations or the high standards of privacy, you can also sell your products in the United States, even if the US did not require and hold you to such high standards. Okay, so we've now identified three factors that explain when a Brussels effect happens. So large market, regulatory capacity, and the, uh, the propensity to then regulate with stringent regulations. But the EU cannot set the rules for the world across all areas of regulation. So let me give you two more criteria that explains when the Brussels effect happens. So the fourth criteria is that the EU can only set the global rules when it regulates what I call inelastic targets, the targets that cannot move. So capital, for instance, is mobile. If the EU is, is having too stringent capital regulations or financial regulations, money can move. You can list your companies elsewhere. So the EU is not in a position to set all the rules for financial industry, for instance. The final criteria is that we have a global rule only emerge when those standards are what I call non-divisible. It means that when it is in the company's interest to pursue a uniform rule and basically elevate the regulatory standards across the global marketplace, as opposed to taking advantage of lower standards in different markets. So when the uniformity is more beneficial than customization across the different markets. So that often explains why, for instance, if we have uh, these tech companies deciding to have a single privacy rule, they do not want to always trace where is the IP address, where is the search being made, how much privacy do I give to this particular user? So sometimes it's a technological difficulty of always telling where different uh, consumers are. But often it's just an economic logic of scale economies. If you are producing automobiles, it is very expensive to set up multiple different production lines in order to produce a different variant for different markets. There are scale economies of making one type of car and selling that in different markets. So now we've talked about what are the criteria under which you can see a, uh, the European Union become a global regulatory hegemon. Let me pause for a moment and ask the question whether this really matters. And here I argue that it does matter because regulations affect all of us every day and everywhere. So the EU is able to set the standards for antitrust law, for privacy law, for chemical regulation, for environmental regulation, and for food safety. So what the EU does affects the air we breathe, the food we eat, and the products we produce and consume. So to me, that is power, that is influence.
and that is continuing relevance. It is also a particularly powerful way to exercise influence because it's almost costless for a European Union. Military power, for instance, is very costly and uncertain to deploy. Economic sanctions are very costly to the state uh, imposing them. Whereas when it comes to the Brussels effect, all the EU needs to do is to set the regulations. Then it sits back and it lets the global companies to export those regulations and bear the cost of, com of complying with those regulations. So in that sense, it is a particularly penetrating, a unique and effective way of, of uh, leveraging uh, power and influence today. So let me now ask the question of whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. Should we be very worried about what the EU is doing or should we be celebrating the European regulatory influence? And here, I don't think there is a single answer. Even in this Zoom call, I acknowledge that some of you may be quite worried about the EU being in the position to decide what you are eating and what kind of air you're breathing. Whereas others think that, look, maybe that is actually getting us to an environmentally better place. Maybe I am benefiting from more use of privacy online because of the EU. Maybe my food is safer or the products that I'm using, the toys my children have, have fewer chemicals because of the EU. So let me offer three common criticisms that have often been leveraged against the Brussels effect. So first of those says that regulation is costly and it deters innovation. And if the Brussels effect is right, the EU is exporting of those costs. We are multiplying those costs and suddenly we're losing innovation benefits in other parts of the world as well. And I would invite all of us to take that criticism seriously. I remember when I was researching the book and I was having an interview with one Silicon Valley executive and I ask him, what is the difference when you are dealing with American regulators and with European regulators? And he told me the following. Well, the Europeans want us to satisfy a consumer need. What the Americans want is they want us to change the world or allow the world to be changed. And let me suggest that we want Sometimes companies do really want to change the world. Some of the most disruptive innovations can happen if the companies have the ambition to go beyond satisfying existing consumer need. But at the same time, I think it would be wrong to assume that every time regulation leads to more expensive products or less innovation. There is, for instance, a lot of ex uh, uh, examples of energy efficient technologies that are not only good for the environment, but that also make the products more efficient uh, and are more, co more cost effective at the same time. There's a wonderful book by a French economist, Thomas Philippon, who teaches at NYU here in New York, called The Great Reversal, How America Gave Up on Free Markets. And he argues that it is because of the lack of antitrust regulation that the American markets today are more concentrated than the European markets. They are less competitive. The prices are higher for consumers and the, and the profits are higher for the companies. Because the EU intervenes with more anti-regulation, there is more competition. That is the reason why I pay so much less for my flight from Brussels to Madrid than I pay for my flight from New York to Minnesota. That's why my cell phone plan in Europe is a fraction of what my cell phone plan in the US costs, because there's regulation in the EU, because there's antitrust intervention. So this is just to suggest that any idea of saying that every time regulation has a same effect on prices and innovation, to me, just needs to be a little bit more nuanced. Sometimes good regulation really makes the markets more efficient, whereas bad regulation can indeed have harmful consequences. So let me now move to the second criticism that one often hears uh, about uh, regulation. And that is the idea that what the Europeans actually are doing is they are not just regulating, they are engaging in regulatory protectionism. The motivation behind these European regulations is to try to give a leg up 
to European companies that cannot otherwise compete with more efficient, more innovative American counterparts. So where are the European tech giants? Is that the reason why Europeans are going after Google and Facebook and Apple and Amazon? There's currently an antitrust investigation pending against all these four large players. And in the last years, the EU has already leveraged three fines amounting to almost $10 billion against Google. So especially when it comes to antitrust regulation, there is often an accusation made that look at who are the targets in these regulations. They are always US companies. So is this just envy driven protectionism? And here I'm quite comfortable saying that I do not believe that protectionism is what is motivating the Europeans. They are American companies, but they are also the biggest companies that have the greatest ability to impede competition on the marketplace. And if you look at, there is no European search engine that the European regulators are trying to protect when they go after Google. There is no European big social media company that gets the benefit if there is a fine against Facebook. And if you look back, there's often American companies suing these same American companies. So they go to the European Commission. Who was the complainant in the first case against Google? It was Microsoft. It was another American company. So often there are American companies on both sides of the dispute. I remember talking to the US ambassador, uh, Tony Gardner under President Obama. He was based in Brussels at the US ambassador to the EU. And he told me that I never lobbied for American companies because I did not know what the American interest was. They were always American companies on both sides of the dispute. So that takes some of the force away from the idea that this is just a protectionist plot by the Europeans. But let me add here a word of caution. Since I published the book two years ago, I think the conversation is shifting around the world towards greater protectionism. And Europe is not shielded from that. So if you look at even though the European track record is not that antitrust has been used as a tool for protectionism, there was, for instance, a, a uh, couple of years ago, there was a proposed merger between two European rail giants, Siemens and Alstrom, and the European Commission blocked the merger. There was a big uproar in Europe saying, you should be supporting a European champions. How can we otherwise compete against big Chinese companies in this field? But the Commission held firm saying that, look, we are not here because of protectionism. We are not here to protect the European uh, champions. We are here to protect the consumer interests. And this transaction is not good for European consumers. France and Germany, these, co these companies that we're trying to merge came from those countries, were very upset. And they declared a manifesto where they were asking for more industrial policy considerations to be incorporated into competition law, into antitrust law in Europe. The commission held firm Antitrust law wasn't rewritten, but I want to acknowledge that there are those voices emerging in Europe as well that are calling for that kind of change. But up until today, it has been a neutral competition law that has served Europeans well, and that has also been the one that the Europeans have been exporting to the other parts of the world. Okay, so I've now reviewed two potential normative criticisms against the European global regulatory power, the cost, then the innovation, and then the idea of protectionism. Let me now introduce a third criticism that I often hear as well. And that is the accusation that is more political as opposed to economic. And that is the idea that the Europeans are engaged in regulatory imperialism that here the Europeans go again, wanting to set the rules for the rest of the world, overriding the preferences of democratic govern governments in other parts of the world who are now deprived of the ability to set the rules for their electorate, for their people. So in that sense, the Europeans would be basically overriding, for instance, the preferences of American consumers who may not value privacy as much 
who may not occasionally want to then pay more for the products because they are uh, environmentally more sustainable. So the idea is that the, somehow the political autonomy of the stakeholders in other countries is being compromised because of what the Europeans are doing. And here, I think it is a legitimate conversation to be had because the truth is that, for instance, we have many African farmers that are refraining from using GMOs, the genetically modified organisms, because Europeans don't want them and Europeans don't allow them for their markets. But maybe some of these farmers would actually need to use GMOs because they also need to feed their own growing populations. It is true that Americans have more privacy today because European consumers like more privacy. So the question though is whether that is regulatory imperialism. And the way the European regulators can respond to this concern is to say, look, we are just regulating our own market. We are not imposing you to have, you Facebook, you Google, to also offer these privacy protections for Americans. It is your business decision, not ours. The same for African farmers. They say, well, as long as you, you apply our regulations for the products that you're exporting to Europe, you are free to do whatever for your own markets. But obviously it is hard for an African farmer to divide the field in two parts and have GMOs in one, not GMOs in the other. What happens if there's cross-pollination? and part of the European slot gets tainted. They get banned from the European market. It's too risky. The same way that many American companies are saying, it is just not in our interest to produce certain makeup, for instance, cosmetics that have certain chemicals. And then uh, another ones that don't have the chemicals because we need to get them to the European market. So in practice, European rules are dictating how we are doing business. The biggest defense the Europeans are leveraging here, though, is that they really do say that it's our sovereignty and we have not only sovereign right, but the sovereign obligation to regulate our own market. So ultimately, that is not the same as regulatory imperialism. We are not imposing anything on anyone. And let me offer one, and I know this can be controversial counter argument as well. So there are some voices in America who say that, look, actually, what the Brussels effect does is that it is offsetting some of the deficiencies in how democracy in America works. We have corporations that have too much power that are lobbying in Washington to the extent that they are overriding the voices of American consumers. We don't have as much privacy in the US as our consumers would actually want. We don't have as strong environmental protections as a healthy democratic process would generate because we have so much power for the corporations, because we have decisions like Citizen United that have made it possible to have unlimited campaign contributions. So in many ways, this argument goes, the Europeans are offsetting some of the excess of corporate influence in America. I realize it's controversial and I wish, and, and I welcome a pushback on all of those as well. Let me now uh, move to, um, the, uh, what I would say the last part of uh, my lecture, and it's really to look into the future. So we've talked uh, until now about the European Union being powerful today, but the question is how long will the Brussels effect last? Will it maybe in 10 years be overtaken by the Beijing effect when they do build the capacity, when the size of the European market is relatively speaking even, even smaller? So let me offer a first preface where I go back to what is the precondition for being a unilateral global regulator. You do need to have a large market. And I would never argue that the European Union's market size, relatively speaking, is growing because it's not, it is going down. It is true that every year China is relatively larger than the EU, and then, then uh, the US. Other growing markets, be it India or others as well, the relative market size of the EU goes down. And with that, it is possible that the Brussels effect also weakens because there can be more opportunities to divert your trade elsewhere and abandon the European market. 
But let me argue why I don't think it is likely that we see the Beijing effect, for instance, to replace the Brussels effect anytime soon. So first of all, I mentioned that it takes a while to build regulatory capacity. But it's also going to take a while before there will be demand for as high regulations in China as there are in Europe. It is not the GDP that tells you whether a country is likely to regulate. It's the GDP per capita. It's how wealthy the consumers are, whether they can afford to care about the environment, about privacy, uh, about food safety, or whether they just really need to think about the cost of the product. And it's going to be a long time before the GDP per capita in China reaches the level that it is today in Europe. For a long time still, China will not care about regulation as much as the Europeans do. And by the time that GDP per capita is at the higher level, most likely the overall GDP growth will have slowed down to the extent that the Chinese government might be quite concerned about regulating. Let me offer another caveat here, the way I offer a caveat about shifting conversation about protectionism. There are domains within which China is regulating and where it is making inroads around the world. It's not the same logic as the Brussels effect, but it is still shows that China is getting more assertive. So it has started a massive crackdown of the technology industry in China. Those effects are mainly felt in China. But the effects that we are feeling around the world is the Chinese companies building what is known as the digital Silk Road. They are building telecommunications infrastructure around the world. One of the issues that the US is trying to prevent many of its allies to use the Chinese 5G, Huawei, for instance, building the infrastructure, but the US is not being particularly successful because the US can offer an alternative. China is offering relatively good and very cheap digital infrastructure for countries that need it as they path for development. So China is getting more powerful, but the logic that applies to the Brussels effect, the kind of unilateral power which is transported through the markets, we're not gonna see Beijing effect take over the Brussels effect anytime soon. So the argument is mainly that the, the EU's regulatory power will outlive its power measured by the GDP alone. So let me now uh, move to another potentially challenge to the Brussels effect. And that comes from technological developments. So you remember that one of the key uh, the features of the Brussels effect theory was this idea that the production is often not divisible. So the idea that there are still scale economies for uniform production, that you do not customize something for different markets. But we also see some technological developments like 3D printing, which is part of additive manufacturing, that may allow you quite cheaply to print locally in different markets the variants of the product. Again, that is an interesting development, but I think it's going to take a while before that is available in domains other than, for instance, um, very high-end uh, manufacturing medical equipment or something like that. So I think scale economies matter still for some time. Let me now offer an internal challenge to the Brussels effect. So there's two of them that I would want to highlight. So one of them is this idea that the anti-EU sentiment, the populist voices in the EU are growing. You have likely followed about the developments in places like Hungary and Poland, where we have uh, not only rule of law backsliding, real challenges to democracy, but general anti-EU sentiments. So if that becomes a prevalent narrative across different parts of the EU, we might come to the point where the member states are no longer giving the EU the regulatory powers, whereby the EU no longer has the political, the regulatory capacity and the political will to generate those regulations. But here too, I am less concerned about what Hungary and Poland, for instance, will do to the Brussels effect. I am very concerned what they do to democracy and generally what they do to European integration. But if you think about what their concerns are, they are not that worried about fighting food safety or privacy regulations. They are most wor worried about controlling their judiciary, controlling their press, and making sure they can keep migrants out of the EU. 
when it comes to single market economic regulation, that's not where their biggest fights are. And those regulations don't require unanimity among the member states. So they are not in a position to use their veto power and prevent the EU from regulating. But let me now add another, uh, uh, and, and I'm, I'm uh, moving towards the end of my presentation because I'm really eager to hear your questions and proceed based on those. But I do need to mention Brexit. So the UK's departure from the EU. And will that actually weaken the Brussels effect? So first of all, yes, the EU just lost a big part of its market. It is now less powerful because it is less uh, 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 large of a market. It also lost a lot of important regulatory capacity. The Brits were good. They were very good regulators. And I think that served Europe well. However, they were not always that willing to regulate. And in many ways, they were the pro-market voices that were sometimes skeptical of the EU regulating. Now that they are gone, we have more space for the more pro-regulation countries like France and Germany to set the rules. So what I argue in the book though, is that Brexit doesn't undermine the Brussels effect, but the Brussels effect does undermine Brexit. The Brussels effect explains why there is no such thing as regulatory sovereignty that would have awaited the UK on the other side of Brexit. The UK's economic destiny will remain tied to the European Union. Almost half of the UK exports are still here at going to the European market. The EU is the number one export market for critical UK industries, including um, aerospace, financial services, um, automobile manufacturing, uh, uh, pharmaceuticals, chemical industry. So if you are a UK manufacturer of automobiles, are you more interested in making cars that you can sell to the European Union that is six times the size of your domestic market? Or do you rather make cars that are fit for production and sale in your domestic market? You need to get to the European market. Then your question is, is it in my interest to set up a separate production line and produce something different for the UK market? Many of them say it's not. And that's why the business opposed Brexit. They realized that they will continue to be bound by the European rules. Here is something for the proponents of Brexit. Not only Brexit fails to liberate the UK from the shackles of European regulation, most likely, the UK companies will live in an ever more regulated Europe because they have chosen to step away and be rule takers as opposed to rule makers. The UK is bound by those rules, but it has no say over those rules. And get, let me go back to the French and the Germans who now have more, a more voice over what those regulations look like. And they like regulation more than the Brits do. So in that sense, Brexit was a big false promise where there are limits to how much regulatory sovereignty the UK ultimately can play. So whether and what we are seeing right now and what's the next frontier of the Brussels effect. So let me just offer a few of those so that there are a couple of news developments that I hope you will have on your radar. So there are a couple of priorities for the European Union. One is fighting climate change, and we are seeing a massive regulation towards limiting emission of carbon. Europe is going to lead the way towards electric cars. And one of the logics is the Brussels effect that that will happen elsewhere as well. If there will be no demand for anything but electric cars in the European market, there will be a global shift towards producing those cars. The second priority is digital regulation. There are massively ambitious regulations pending right now before the European institutions, regulating artificial intelligence, regulating the rights of gig workers, um, and regulating then competition with more stringent ex-ante rules that allow the European Commission to intervene earlier in the process. And a really ambitious Digital Services Act that will offer more stringent and binding obligations on the platforms that are moderating the content online. We will see more transparency of the algorithms that they are using to basically uh, 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 moderate the content that we all see daily when we are engaging online. 
So in that sense, I expect the Brussels effect to continue. The regulatory activity will continue. The COVID did not stop that. If anything, I think there's been more and more focus on regulating certain issues such as food safety and more consciousness of the importance of the digital economy that has sustained us throughout the pandemic. So my prediction is not only do I claim that the Brussels effect is here and it shapes your lives and my life every day, it will continue to do so for the foreseeable future. So let me end it there, Tim, and I, I welcome any and all questions that you have about what I said or what I may uh, have failed to, failed to mention. Thank you, Anu. That was, that was really interesting, and I'm sure we'll have many questions. So as a reminder, I see the questions starting to come in. Uh, if you're wondering how to do that, on the bottom of your Zoom screen, there should be a button for Q&A. You can put your question directly into, uh, into that, that box, and then I will work to filter them back to, to Anu. Uh, so the first question um, has to do with one of the, the, the theme of democracy, especially in Eastern Europe that you mentioned. Uh, so you, you described the populist movements in Poland and Hungary, for example, and the threats that those may pose to liberal democracy and the rule of law. So the question is, can the EU help to avert those threats? And if so, how? So it is a terrific, terrific question. And I'm, I'm glad we get started with something so, so foundational. So I wish I could say that the EU is in well placed. To, to fend off those threats, but the EU has actually been quite weak in tackling that crisis. So the EU foundational treaties did not give the EU the power to really intervene because one kind of, I would say in hindsight, mistake was made. There was an idea that if there was one rogue nation, the others could reach a unanimous decision to impose more potent sanctions vis-a-vis -vis that member. But we cannot get that consensus among everybody else because Poland backs Hungary and Hungary backs Poland. So if we try to have an EU resolution against Hungary, Poland says, you know, you don't have my vote. And then if we try to go after Poland, Hungary says that I am protecting basically Poland. That's their sovereignty, that's their business. So that doesn't mean that nothing gets done. There's been successful lawsuits to the European Court of Justice that have, for instance, issued many rulings that show that these countries are violating the rule of law. So there are some consequences that have been attached and some ultimatums that have been uh, imposed. One effective tool is that there was this massive rescue fund following the pandemic that is distributing funds to member states. There's a rule of law conditionality. And now the other member states are basically saying that if you don't back off from some of those uh, rule of law violations, you will not get the funds. And both Poland and Hungary are net recipients that need the EU funding. So now we are using the budget to impose some sanctions. But I still think that we have a long way to go to say that we really have an upper hand and complete ability to control the crisis. Okay, thank you. So uh, moving sort of to the next uh, topic, which you know, is sort of the, the, the topic on everyone's mind right now, which, which is the situation in Ukraine. And you, you knew this was coming, right? You knew you were going to get this question. As we're meeting tonight, I think Emmanuel Macron is in Moscow. Uh, for, for posterity's sake and the recording's sake, we're, have, we're ha having this lecture in February of 2022 amid high tensions between Russia and Ukraine. So there's a question about this, which is a general question and pretty open-ended for you, Anu. Uh, and it's just, how does Ukraine and this situation with Russia fit into your conceptualization of the Brussels effect? So it fits in the sense, and thank you for this question. It's obviously one of those that keeps us all uh, very much alert and concerned about the escalation of the situation. And one of those, let me sort of build what I earlier said, that the EU, I've talked a lot about the strength of the EU, how the EU is powerful, and it's powerful through law and powerful through using its market as a, a tool for access 
and, and conditional in basically conditioning the access to certain compliance. But the EU has been weaker when it comes to protecting democracy, and the EU is weaker when it comes to foreign policy. And here the reason is that when all everything that we talked about in my lecture, the EU has the competence to do. But when it comes to foreign policy, it's the member states that have retained the power and not the EU. So we cannot say that it was Emmanuel Macron that now went to uh, meet President Putin. It wasn't Ursula von der Leyen because the EU does not have, EU is not in charge, it's the member states. And that's why the EU is not always united in its relationship towards Russia. So this is both in terms of how the EU handles China and how it handles Russia, because different member states have different political alliances, different economic energy dependencies, and some are much more concerned and want to have a harder line against Russia. So if you think about the concern in Poland, in Baltic countries, it is very high, and they are very concerned about their own security when it comes to more assertive Russia. They are closer, and it's not a concern that the Portuguese share. It's not the concern that the Spaniards share to the same extent. So that to, the, the relative salience of the national security situation involving Russia, for instance, is different to different member states. And the lack of the common European foreign policy powers makes it harder to have a decisive response. Now, to add to that, there's also the question of how the Europeans are coordinating with Americans. There's less trust left after the President Trump era when the cooperation just was not there. And now there's been an effort to build that trust, but I think it is still somewhat in a shaky foundation. And the question is how much in unison is the US and then the fragmented Europe approaching the, the question of Russia. And let me just remind uh, those who may not remember where the origins of the Ukraine conflict started. It wasn't a national security conflict. It started from the European Union offering a trade agreement an economic partnership to Ukraine. So that was one of those issues that the EU was adamant, that Ukraine is a sovereign independent nation that can decide on its trade policy. And trade is something that the EU has the competence on. It's not like the foreign policy. The commission, the EU was in a position to offer that deal and negotiate that deal. The never did the EU think at that point that one day this trade agreement would pave way for a political, geopolitical foreign policy conflict where the EU is losing some of its ability to treat this as a trade matter. So that was what triggered President Putin and that's what basically got Russia worried that now Ukraine is pulling much closer to the European Union. But it didn't start as a geopolitical conflict, but this is where we are today. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a couple more questions coming in, but while we're on this topic and and after uh, we've asked you to talk about Russia, I want to point you in the direction of China. You you mentioned you you discussed the possibility of a Beijing effect, um, and I just want to want to hear you speak about about China a little bit a little bit more, in particular related to Chinese investments around the world. We see massive Chinese investments in infrastructure and development in Latin America and Africa. And so with this sort of Chinese role globally, you know, in especially in, in you know, the, the global South, I wonder how you fit that into your, your conceptualization. Yeah, so very, very interesting. And a little bit, I think it tags along what I said about Russia is that Different member states, are, are not in, in, they don't have a uniform view on how to deal with China. So there are markets like Germany that is trading massively with China, that has been willing to have a sort of a, a mitigated uh, conflict at best, meaning that it hasn't wanted to be too assertive. It wants to retain the export opportunities for German companies in the Chinese market, whereas others have been more of a hardliner. So where this, for instance, really manifested itself. And again, we are now back uh, back team in this foreign policy realm where there's no uniform European policy. When China offered to build the 5G networks in Europe, different member states had a different response. Some let Huawei in, others did not. US was trying to cajole everybody to basically turn down Huawei 
And there are some countries, for instance, those basically that are uh, a much more sort of closer, the US allies, for instance, the ones who are NATO members in Eastern Europe need the strong US support in their dealings with Russia. They didn't want to upset the US. They were more willing to ban Huawei. Whereas others say that, look, this is cheap. This is good. We need it. And there's no national security concern. So the Europeans are somewhat divided on how to deal uh, with China. But the Europeans are getting increasingly concerned. So I would say that if anything, Europeans are moving a little bit closer, not quite there where America is, but moving a little bit closer. They've joined in one recent instant in sanctions against China, sort of joining the US in that. Um, and now more countries have sort of overturned their decision and are actually not letting Huawei into their networks. <clears throat> there was a um, investment treaty signed between uh, China and the European Union. Germany was a big proponent uh, of this deal. America was very much taken back that the Europeans went ahead with that. Now that deal is frozen. It's basically stalled in the European Parliament because of escalating conflicts and concern about human rights abuses in China. So the European Parliament is basically feeling that the value conflict is so high that we cannot just pursue the economic relationship with China. And there's an increasing concern of China's way of, like you said, Tim, building these infrastructures around the world and potentially exporting its surveillance mechanism in the process. So that's one of the major concerns that there is actually a lot of demand for this Chinese infrastructure. Authoritarianism is on the rise. Democracy is in decline. And there are many governments who said, we actually need this for law enforcement purposes. And they even have populations who say that we have high crime in this country. I want to feel safe. I, I can't afford to care about my privacy. So you surveil. If you keep me safe, you go for it. So in that sense, I think it's a longer, a longer answer maybe that you were asking for, uh, Tim, but I think it's a complicated question um, and Europeans have a hard time balancing it. OK, fair enough. Um, the world is a complicated place. So um, especially today. Yeah. So there are a variety of questions actually that have to do with food and sustainability issues. Um, you, you talked a little bit about pesticides, for example. Um, I'm going to kind of lump a few of these together because interestingly, there are a couple of questions that have a little bit of a different interpretation of the situation. So there are several questions asking about how can the US sort of follow the EU model to increase food safety and sustainability, um, you know, to move away from large farming subsidies and, 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 and shift our agriculture in a more, towards a more European uh, yeah. direction. Then there are others that, that take a different view and see uh, EU regulation as potentially, as potentially limiting for the US and, and ask, you know, the, the question in particular asks, how can we, we in the US, protect ourselves from, uh, from the EU when they don't have the same types of regulations that we have here, whether it's for food or other types of chemicals? Um, and I wanted to add to that, too, and just to give you maybe something pointed to respond to, uh, you know, something we read about a lot in the news, you know, here in Duluth, we're, we're a little bit north of farm country, but we're close enough, right? So something that's that's something on our minds is the uh, acquisition of Monsanto by Bayer. And I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to that. Last I checked, glyphosate is coming in for regulation in, in, within the EU soon. And speaking of Chinese investments in Africa and Latin America, if the EU, if the EU uh, regulates glyphosate in that way, it'll certainly impact farmers in other parts of the world. So I wonder if you could kind of take this food question and you know, give us a broad view, but also specifically, how do these types of corporate issues r related to herbicides or intellectual property and patent law, how do these kinds of things uh, yeah. come into play? So really interesting, and I'm not at all surprised. I think it just shows that it's a very uh, nuanced thinking uh, in, among the people that it actually comes to both directions, because food is not a straightforward issue. So we don't see Brussels effect across all the fields. But we see it affect parts of food safety. So it's not one of those where, we, where there's an easy uniform answer. So first of all, agriculture is one of the examples where the European market is not 
that significant for American farmers that there are farmers who can afford not to trade in, in the EU. There are enough of domestic demand and alternative markets that every farmer in the US is not tailoring their farming products to the European Union. At the same time, there are a couple of reasons why many American farmers that wouldn't be directly exporting to Europe are still bound by European rules. And that is because many of the multinational food producers refrain from buying any grain, for instance, from a farmer that uses GMOs. Basically, they say, we just don't take the risk that something gets commingled either at the, the, on the fields, at the time of harvesting, at the time of transportation, that in, in many ways, we just basically go for the, 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 the highest uh, the standard and choose to uh, only uh, source from the farmers who follow the European rules so that we will not have an export issue. So the longer the supply chain and the more you have multinational companies like big companies and as one of those ones sourcing from you, the more likely the European rules are going to affect you. But there's also a dynamic whereby the European, for instance, aversion to GMOs, it's not fully shared in the United States, but many consumer groups have basically gotten the arguments from Europe and use them also in domestic uh, uh, political debates and domestic regulatory debates. And there is a movement towards more labeling of GMOs, for instance, in different parts of the world. So it's not as strict, but it's still more of a, an, an issue shaping consumer uh, behavior. So um, there's also certain areas in the rule uh, in the uh, food safety, which I would mention as, as sort of deviating from the logic of the Brussels effect, because generally when you have a high standard, for instance, for um, greenhouse gas emissions, you can comply with different jurisdictions by complying with the highest standard. There is no jurisdiction that forces you to emit carbon. So you don't have this weird situation whereby you cannot emit carbon for Europe, but you have to emit carbon for the US. You can just say that you have a jurisdiction that doesn't care, but they certainly don't ban your products when they are more environmental. That doesn't always work in food safety. So we have a famous disagreement when it comes to chlorine rinsed chicken. Europeans don't accept the chicken that has been rinsed with chlorine. They think that is really dangerous. Americans want and demand the chicken to be rinsed with chlorine for that chicken to be safe. And you cannot have a chicken that is and is not rinsed with chlorine. So that's one of those examples where you basically have, you need to choose one market or the other, or you need to have two different factories, two different production lines. It's a little bit similar when it comes to animal testing for cosmetics. Europeans don't take cosmetics in their markets if they've been tested on animals. In some parts, at least until recently, China was demanding animal testing. So you cannot also test and not test on animals. So those are the exceptions to the Brussels effect, but I think they're very, very interesting. So when it comes to Monsanto and, and, and pesticides and, uh, and genetically modified um, organisms, Monsanto has been one of those targets. They are not popular in, in Europe. Europeans basically say that whether these are prohibited or not, we don't want that big farming. Food is, it's about food safety and it's about culture around food. And it's one of those that we actually like, it, it sort of intervenes in many levels. I don't want it, whether it's safe for me or not, besides it's probably not safe. It's also not good for the environment. So there's an environmental and human health aspect that really come, come together. And in many ways, the Monsanto, for instance, has said that it's not worth fighting the battles because the market is just not there. So in many ways, they have had to back off uh, from the European markets because they cannot change the way the consumers are perceiving uh, this food. So I could talk a lot about food. I think it's a really, really interesting uh, domain. But it's also one of those where the consumer preferences can be quite um, deeply felt. So consumers normally have a view on food. They don't necessarily have a view on certain chemicals. So if they have textiles, you, you buy sneakers, you buy a sweater, you buy paint, you don't necessarily ask what chemicals are being used. But when it comes to food, you do ask about the, the, the chemicals. And there are examples uh, of preservatives, for instance. And there are examples where the consumer preferences are so strong that the companies have decided to produce two different variants just because the consumer demand is different. So if we think about Smarties, the candy, the colors pop in the US, 
they don't pop in the EU because the preservatives that make those bright colors are not used and allowed in Europe. They use natural coloring agents. But the demand is so high if the colors are brighter in the US that they made a decision that it's better to produce two different products. How about intellectual property law? How, where does where does the EU stand on that vis-a-vis uh, -vis the US and, and some of these issues? So, yeah, so the IP, it, it, there's a little bit more complicated interaction between they're not just being only European level patterns, but also the member state level patterns. There are some areas like the IP for uh, pharmaceuticals where the US and the EU are not necessarily that far apart and where we can see both of them being some of the dominant uh, standard setters. But the Europeans have a very strong pharmaceutical industry. The, the area where I think they, least, they, they last time came into conflict was basically whether we are they waiving some of the IP protections for COVID vaccine. So we, whether we basically lift the patent protections where um, the Europeans were portrayed as bad guys by saying that we basically will hold on to the IP uh, protections for our pharmaceuticals and Americans said we need to make an exception and allow for the production of these vaccines. But the Europeans were saying that look what Americans are actually doing it's going to take a long time to actually revamp the prote uh, protection so it's a it's a not a genuine solution to the crisis and it distracts us from other things that we need to do to make sure that we can address uh, address the COVID-19. Thanks. Uh, so here, sort of uh, switching gears a little bit, there's another question about Brexit. So um, the question asks, are there countries in the EU planning on leaving like the UK did? Um, and I think maybe harkening back to our earlier discussion about, about populism and democracy. Um, it, if so, will it be like Brexit where the Brussels effect is still influencing them even after they've left? Yeah, so terrific. It's, it's really, it was interesting that there was this fear that if the UK leaves, the others will follow. And there was this idea that some say that the reason the EU needs to make it very hard for the UK is to, to show to the rest of the world that the Brexit is not worth it. Well, the EU didn't need to make it particularly hard for the UK. The UK itself made it very hard for the UK. It's been very difficult to disentangle for the EU. And the way it has made the UK's internal and its external policies, if I can say, very, very complicated, if not use the word, just a big mess, um, it's not a very inspiring template for the rest of the world to follow. They have realized that what was supposed to be easy, there was supposed to be a technical solution for everything, including what to do with the Irish border when basically there is this problem that the Northern Ireland is still part of the UK yet, uh, it is part of the, the, the European single market. Um, there is no technical solution. It's a massive political headache and it's very difficult to resolve. Um, the, Euro, the UK is taking a hit in terms of economic growth. It is hard to replicate the trade relations uh, fully that it had um, uh, as, as part of the EU. So we don't see other countries, the, France, the French don't talk about Brexit at this point. Uh, the Netherlands doesn't talk about leaving. I think um, in terms of what Poland and Hungary are, I think some would say that it would make EU much easier place to deal if they left, but they don't really want to leave. So, so currently we do not see the UK example inspire the others because they have really shown how hard it is to leave. And the UK might have been one of the best positioned countries to leave because they also have external, um, sort of the, they own, for instance, their connections to the United States and other parts of the world, they are still a large economy, they are wealthier than many of the member states, so they could have been in a position to do that. And if the UK can't pull it off, it's very hard for the others to follow course. Um, how about uh, Turkey? There's a question about Turkey. What would Turkey have to do in order to, to join the EU or at least to fully join uh, the EU? Yeah, so great, great, uh, uh, also difficult question. There's a custom union. So Turkey is already in close partnership and that was negotiated as a part of the sort of preparing Turkey for the eventual accession. So it was always controversial 
uh, because Turkey in many ways was considered not to share all the fundamental values of the EU relating to um, you know, democracy, the treatment of, of women. Uh, and uh, if you think about some, uh, the religious diversity that was difficult for some uh, in Europe to um, sort of reconcile what it would do to European culture, for instance. But we are now moved away from the point where we are even really planning on Turkey's succession. So it seems like Turkey doesn't really want to join and Europe is quite lukewarm. And, and, and given the way that Turkey has moved towards more authoritarian direction under President Erdogan, I think the accession to the EU would be extremely difficult. And the EU also has had a hard time um, really integrating some of these Eastern European countries. If you think about Poland and Hungary, you can impose a bunch of concessions on these countries when they first join. But if they start backsliding from those concessions, it's very hard at that point to address them. So I think the fear would be that even if the EU could extract a set of commitments from Turkey, what happens if Turkey is in and it doesn't follow through? So, um, so unfortunately, we moved to the situation where I just don't see that the, 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 the remaining differences between the two, they are not closing, they are rather increasing. The treatment of journalists in Turkey um, is a concern for, for the European democratic principles. Um, so independence of the, the, the various institutions, the, the various democratic rights and, and how the government, uh, according to the EU, fails to protect them. So I don't see that happen anytime soon. Okay, so um, we have sort of a bird's eye view question here. Uh, so you, you described how one of the, um, you know, sort of three defining features of the Brussels effect is political will. Mm -hmm. And you described that in particular as something lacking in the US and in Washington in particular. So the question is sort of an opinion question, uh, given all that you've, you've studied and researched on this, would it benefit the US given our, our political divisiveness, would it benefit the US to have a multiple party system? I, I guess mm -hmm. more than two parties. Uh, on a more parliamentary model like like the like the European countries, uh, would that be would that be beneficial for this this issue of political will? So so let me maybe preface by saying that at this moment the current system doesn't seem to be working well. So that I think would sort of give us a I think an invitation to think about alternatives. So currently the US political dysfunction in the Congress really prevents the US from addressing many of the important issues. Whether the US could really implement a multi-party solution, in many ways, if you think about how the Republican party has sort of morphed into two different wings and how um, the current, uh, the, the Republican party, for instance, under President Trump has very little resemblance to some of the old Republican ideas. Um, the Republicans were free traders. What happened to free traders? Uh, the way we think about democracy today and some of the, the different policies that were pursued by President Trump, they have very little resemblance by some of those Republican ideas. If you think about the Democratic Party, it's also very divided. If you think about the more of the left wing of the Democratic Party, and if you think about the more centrist Democrats. So in many ways, because we don't have a multi-party system. In the European political map, this already would be separate parties because in many ways, the ideological divergence uh, across these parties are also rather stark. So I don't know whether we will see a multi-party system uh, emerge, but certainly there would need to be some really, um, the, the, the idea that for instance, that we cannot really find bipartisan consensus on anything, to me is, is quite striking feature. And I don't see that happen in, the, in, in Europe. So one of the biggest reasons why we see Europe regulate so much is that for instance, both left and right believe that sustainability is important. Climate change is the problem. Um, that personal privacy matters. It is a fundamental right. That we need to have some kind of a social safety net. You don't need to be whether you are right or left. There's still sort of fundamental uh, political consensus. Um, let me offer another suggestion that I think might be uh, even a bigger culprit or, or explains the polarization. We don't watch the same news. We have different news channels. We read different news. 
uh, outlets in Europe, even the, the UK that is divided by the Brexit, they still all watch BBC. Most of the European countries still have a national public radio. So there's still a public conversation where different parts of the society come together and can have the same conversation. And that's one of the things that to me is so crucially important, that we need to be able to talk across the divisions to understand each other better and, and to be able to have those difficult societal conversations of where we are heading. If we just all go into our extremes, I think it's very hard to see a pathway for any kind of um, sort of socially functioning uh, a, a society that where, where we still reach compromises and where every, every decision is not binary. Okay, so speaking of, of news, actually, we have a uh, sort of a, um, a question related to uh, your sources and where, where you uh, get your information um, and what you might recommend for the rest of us. So the question is, where do you listen to debates on global economics? And is there a YouTube channel or some sort of series that you would recommend that you find particularly interesting and that you might recommend to this group? Oh, excellent. I um, So I love news. So even throughout the, the uh, pandemic, I became a huge fan of podcasts. So I, I listen to a lot of podcasts. And I, um, I find that the think tanks, and I use different ones. So there's a lot of terrific think tanks that whether you want to uh, look at what Carnegie Endowment does or what Brookings does or, or what the Peterson Institute of International Economics does, the European Council of Foreign Relations, there's terrific programming and different guests that they bring. Um, so I do a lot of podcasts, but I must say that I that, that the first news source that I, I read every morning is Financial Times because it is more international. So I traded from reading New York Times first to reading, I still read New York Times, but reading uh, Financial Times because if you want to have a more of a global perspective, they have a very strong coverage on Europe. So, um, but I think there's just tremendous value in in uh, looking for different sources and trying to make sure that you blend your news. I um, don't use much social media. I don't find that to be a very good use of time. I think it distracts. It, it, it basically messes with my focus and ability to read. I, I do follow Twitter a little bit, but I follow different people and sometimes people coming from a different kind of political points of view. So that if there is very big news, so now when we talk about Ukraine news, for instance, there's just, I, I try to make sure that I look at different leaders' comments on them and different sort of intellectual, public intellectuals and thinkers of how they analyze the conflict. So in that sense, the idea that to make sure that you are not just looking at sort of one source, um, but the good investigative journalism that, that publications like The Atlantic or the publications like the, obviously when I do foreign policy, uh, what foreign affairs does, um, it is really carefully done. And, and I think it all serves us, us really well when we read those ones, which really reflect a thorough, carefully investigated uh, news reporting. Okay, thank you. Uh, we, have, we have time for some more questions. I just want to pause here um, and note we have 10 or 15 minutes um, to go if people would like to add more questions. So I just want to to pause and encourage people to submit some more questions in the Q and A. Uh, it's been a, a great discussion so far. Um, anu, do you have anything else that you've been thinking about as as you've been answering these questions? Something that you feel we should cover uh, while we're while we're waiting on on other questions? Is there is there anything you know going back that seems you know like an interesting angle we should pursue further? Yeah, so one of the issues, I think, first of all, the questions have been wide ranging and absolutely terrific. I've really enjoyed them. I'm happy to answer, answer more. I've talked a little bit about technology, maybe partially because my next book, I'm working on the regulation of the digital economy and comparing the American and, and uh, European and Chinese approaches to that. So I think one very big question, and we've talked a little bit about the American politics and whether the political will is there. So let me just add another caveat, the way that I added a caveat that Europe hasn't been protectionist, but the conversation is shifting or China hasn't been building regulatory capacity, but now they are building the infrastructure. I do wanna recognize that even though 
the, U the US Congress hasn't been regulating much. There is a shift in the conversation, and I am watching very carefully whether something will change in the next uh, few years. And in particular, when I talked about the, the, the country being so divided and Congress really not um, uh, agreeing on anything, there seem to be two things that, that the Republicans and Democrats agree. One is that China is bad and needs to be reined in, and the second that the big tech is bad and needs to be reined in. Whether we can go beyond that consensus and actually agree on how to regulate, how to respond to China and how to regulate big tech, I think that's a big question. But I'm watching three developments in the US Congress and in all those, Europe is already the leader. So one is the conversation is shifting whether the US should be rewriting its antitrust laws. President Biden has nomina nominated very pro-enforcement uh, people to the top roles, two of my Columbia colleagues, Lena Khan, who is heading the uh, Federal Trade Commission, and Tim Wu, that is the advisor uh, in the White House. They are very much pro-regulation, and the kind of economic regulation they are endorsing is very similar to what the, what the EU has done. Now, when the EU is at the final stages of preparing its digital markets regulation, there's been some US government concerns that is targeting Americans, but also internal criticism that what the Europeans are asking from our tech companies is exactly what Amy Klobuchar is also proposing in, in, in the Congress. So there is an internal conversation inside the US where there is the US kind of re-examining these techno-libertarian foundations and saying that maybe self-regulation is not good after all. We've seen enough privacy scandals. We've seen enough, if you think about the, the, the January 6th Capitol insurrection, there are fewer people who say that free speech for all online is necessarily serving democracy. The problem for Americans is that people are not quite comfortable with the private companies making those calls, but not too comfortable with the government intervening either, but not also comfortable with nobody doing that. So those, that has been mentioned, and I think that is very true. So there's a understanding that something needs to be done. There's an understanding that we might need a federal privacy law. We are almost an outlier. The rest of the world has a, a variant of the GDPR. The US is holding out. It's California and the few states that have gone ahead with their own ones, but there's no federal privacy law. So I am curious. I don't have an answer for you, but I hope you will be watching with me in this coming year, whether we will see a rewriting of antitrust law by the Congress, or whether we will see the enforcement when finally we have a Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission going after Google and Facebook, whether the courts will actually uh, endorse also the kind of antitrust revolution, or whether we see some of the rewriting of the norms governing online speech. And when you follow that conversation in the US, keep in mind, Europeans already do that. And currently it's the Europeans that are providing more privacy to Americans. It's the Europeans that are setting uh, the way the speech is regulated online. And it's the Europeans that have been the antitrust enforcers around the world. And now the question is whether the US will actually join that effort. So thank you. There, there's, there's at least three uh, questions that I think we could, we could try to get to if we have time. So um, they're all kind of on different topics. So, so we'll see what we get to here in the time remaining. But the first one um, goes back to our discussion of Russia. And, but an element of this we haven't really touched on or that you haven't really touched on yet, which is, which is Russian oil uh, and Germany and the, the role of Russian oil in the Brussels system. So, so what role does Russian oil play in, in uh, the Brussels effect? Okay, another terrific and very hard question. So the EU is not self-sufficient when it comes to energy. The EU needs gas and oil from Russia. And one of the, I think the Ukraine conflict is really illustrating the cost of the kind of dependencies that what happens if Russia will basically shut down uh, uh, its, its energy supplies. And that has really created the impetus for the EU to to transform the energy infrastructure so that the EU could wean itself off gas and oil uh, and, and dependencies from Russia and have more of a different sources of supply. So one of the big uh, sort of geopolitical motivations behind the, the Green Deal 
and uh, and the, the sort of the push towards renewables has been this idea of the EU being vulnerable because it can be held hostage by being dependent. And it's winter, and uh, it's one of those that the options are. It's it, the energy is not optional, and uh, Russia would be hurting itself by basically uh, uh, turning off. Uh, uh, those supplies, but at the same time, there's now uncertainty as to whether the Russians would actually be toying with that strategy. So yes, Europe is vulnerable. Yes, Europe needs to become more self-sufficient. But again, this is difficult because many Europeans, the only way to do that would be, for instance, to build nuclear. And many Europeans are very uncomfortable with nuclear. And it takes a while before you can do it with tr truly renewable sources. So um, that is another uh, one of those sort of strategic dependencies, whether we talk about semiconductors from, from China uh, or Taiwan, or whether we think about um, sort of the uh, uh, various, if we, we wanna build electric cars and we have many uh, lithium and magnesium that is needed for those batteries, China is mainly, and Asia is main producer of those. But with Russia, it's, it's gas and oil that we are most dependent on. Um, yeah, so something very different here. Um, the, the, the question asks, a decade ago, the EU was reeling from the sovereign debt crisis. And um, I think uh, we're, we're thinking about Greece and, and Portugal and places like that. So how was it able to recover so thoroughly? And are there lessons from the recovery to apply going forward? Yeah, no, no, terrific, because those were very difficult times and it was painful. If you think about that, in many ways, there was this difficult situation whereby um, the whole pact, the understanding uh, when agreeing in the euro was that the that sovereign states would not be responsible for each other's debt. Solidarity was not part of the treaty obligations, but also this imposed austerity on countries like Greece was painful and something that these countries didn't foresee when they signed on to Euro. So um, how Europe was able to recover. So first of all, and I think it explains why Europe was able to withstand the COVID related crisis much better, is that there was a massive sort of a push to reform the financial institutions. Uh, as a result of the Euro crisis, it was painful, but the banks are more resilient right now. Um, and generally the financial infrastructure is more elaborate. It's still not complete. The banking union is not there quite as strong as it should be. The capital markets union uh, uh, needs uh, a, a many further steps to be complete. But in many ways, I think that crisis shows us very important lesson on the logic of integration. Europe normally grows through crisis. Every time it goes through the crisis, uh, the solution is more Europe and not less Europe. If you think about migration crisis, what was the reform? We reinforced the external border control uh, that the Frontex. What is the, uh, the, uh, the response to the COVID-19? One of the problem was that health is not a union competence. Now we're planning on a health union. Partially we have now stronger financial institutions because the Euro crisis revealed the deficiencies in the integration relating to finance. So in that sense, Europe has done surprisingly well, um, but at the same time, obviously, there are many challenges where Europe still needs to work on. Okay, so speaking of, you mentioned migration, and we have a question about uh, racial justice issues, and I'm wondering where this might intersect with some of these economic questions. And in particular, I'm wondering if, um, you know, one of the key aspects of the Brussels effect, as you describe it, is, is, is a large market. And you mentioned that, of course, demographically, the European market share is, is declining. So, so with regard to racial justice and migration and, and particularly voting rights issues, um, where does that come into play with, with sort of demographics and, and the large market aspects of, of this system? Yeah. So I would say that the Migration has been one of the big challenges for the European Union, but to me, it's one of the biggest opportunities. European uh, population is declining. The market needs to be dynamic. And I think migrate, there is no solution except that that wouldn't include migration. So I have been a big proponent. I also teach international economic migration that Europe needs to open its borders. Europe needs to uh, welcome many more migrants. And um, 
And uh, some of these refugees coming to Europe as refugees can also be integrated effectively into the labor market and become a solution to the democratic crisis in Europe. So I would like to see Europe embrace migration uh, proactively and decisively and see it as a solution as opposed to a problem, because I think that ultimately will serve Europe much better. It would also bring more diversity to Europe. One of my favorite things about living in America is the, the diversity of this country. I think it's a tremendous richness for this country. We talked a lot about these big technology companies where I started my, my talk. If you look at them, about half of them has an immigrant founder. So immigrants have done tremendously well uh, for this country. And I think that's what Europeans also need to understand. I would say that in many ways, Europeans are not um, very evolved in thinking about all the questions of racial justice. There's still many issues where Europeans really need to be more thoughtful on how to uh, uh, sort of incorporate that into the conversation and make sure, for instance, that we would have, if you look at the European institutions that we talked about today, they are not very diverse, not at all. So there's a long way to go to make sure that the diversity also features in the top leadership positions and in part of the, the decision making. So there are now certain uh, initiatives that the commission has taken. So there's now more research to try to understand the reasons why, for instance, we don't have enough diversity in the European institutions themselves. And also now more decisive measures whereby we would be uh, um, uh, sort of ensuring that the, uh, the, the future path for Europe is much more inclusive and also then racially more diverse. So in, in about two minutes, I'm going to ask you to uh, summarize a quick position to two uh, broad questions that, that may be related. And you've kind of covered this a little bit, but, but there are more questions about it because these are key topics, right? Especially right now. Um, so we were talking about the rise of, of right-wing populism in Eastern Europe in particular. Um, there's one question about will those countries pull the EU, manage to sort of swing the EU more in some of those, uh, some of those directions politically or economically? And then, and then even more broad than that, um, is NATO necessary? Is NATO necessary today? And I'll leave you with that. We'll, we'll let you sort of uh, formulate a minute or two um, to conclude on those notes? Um, very big uh, questions. And let me just acknowledge that, first of all, I'm grateful for them, but I can't do justice them in the, in the short time. But just a few thoughts. Um, I still believe in European commitment to democracy and rule of law. I would like to think that these few countries are aberrations, and ultimately they will not have the, the, the ideas that they endorse do not appeal to Europeans because the ethos is the European Union is still very committed to liberal uh, democracy. And, um, and these countries have very limited following. If you look at the last European Parliament election, there was a tremendous fear that the populists are taking over. They did not take over. They are not that significant in many, in many countries. So I would like to think that they continue to be at the margin. What I worry about though, that in many countries, the mainstream parties are setting their agendas conscious of the political agendas of these extreme parties, which is kind of pulling them also uh, a, a more away, away, away from the center. So I, I would see the movement away from the center, but I do not see the extremists uh, prevailing. But I do worry about democracy. I do worry about the state of democracy. In, in the United States today. I do worry about the growing appeal for authoritarianism. And I think we never should take it for granted. We need to work decisively on a daily basis to defend democracy and understand the stakes involved if we lose the sight of that goal. The second is NATO necessarily. I think right now we are seeing that there is there was a moment when there was a question, is there a task for NATO? I think right now, if we look at the conversation around Russia and Ukraine, it has revived the case for NATO. Um, it has revived the conversation about NATO membership in many countries like Finland and Sweden that have chosen to be neutral. So in many ways, the conflict over Ukraine is giving a sharper focus and a mission uh, for, for NATO. Uh, 
At the same time, I, I think that, that the role of NATO, the US's commitment to NATO, especially under President Trump, it was uncertain. Uh, so sort of what ultimately, if NATO gets tested, and if NATO does not pass the test, then I think the question is not whether NATO is necessarily, but whether the NATO can necessarily deliver the goal and, and what basically justifies its existence. So I regret that we are in the state of the world where we need to have such a heightened focus on the role of the NATO. I would like to believe um, that I would take uh, President Macron's word that we are moving towards de-escalation uh, I am still refreshing my news, so I am not sure whether that's what we read tomorrow. But I think in many ways, there's still a lot that this humanity needs to, to fight together, uh, that, uh, that I think military conflict and escalation and moving to the world where geopolitics is the most defining feature is not obviously the world that, uh, that um, any of us uh, want or need. Okay. Anu Bradford, thank you so much. This was a very insightful uh, discussion and very timely. I think we we uh, we couldn't have asked for a better speaker uh, in in these times in particular. So thank you so much for your uh, for your insights and for sharing them with us tonight. Uh, thank you to all of you who participated and ad, ad, asked questions. Uh, the questions were fantastic. We will uh, do this again on March twenty fourth. We have our final Allworth Center for Peace and Justice lecture on March 24th. That will also be on Zoom. And there will be one at UMD coming up in just a couple of weeks on February 24th. So Anu Bradford, thank you again. And that's, that's it for tonight. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks, everyone.